Uh, today's why you're here today is ClickHouse Bootcamp in 30 minutes. So what are some tips and tricks that you can use to optimize uh, your data that's residing in ClickHouse? And who are we? I'm Adam Jennings, Senior Solutions Architect, uh, Double Cloud. I'm based here in the United States in Indianapolis. And with me today, I have Victor on the call. Yeah, so everybody's hi. So my name is Viktor Kislev. I'm head of a product at Double Cloud, and I have a special T-shirt today because I will ask a stupid question so to Adam <laughs> during his presentation. <laughs> okay, let's go. There, there are no stupid questions, right? Just, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah everybody have... say that. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and so, what is Double Cloud? It's a platform built for end-to-end -end data analytics uh, using some managed open-source technologies. And today, we'll primarily be talking about ClickHouse. So here's uh, four of the most common questions we, that we get asked by our customers uh, when they're dealing with and setting up and trying to optimize their ClickHouse cluster. So how do I optimize my table schema? Um, you know, a little hint of what's to come. We'll talk about order by and compression, sorting and data locality. Um, should I shard my ClickHouse cluster? So should you do it? And um, I'm gonna guess the answer for most of you will be no, and I'll describe that a little bit later on. Um, should you use materialized views or projections? Um, in ClickHouse, materialized views are basically triggers versus projections are more like views in other databases. So we'll talk about the differences there. And then does ClickHouse support joins? Oh boy, do we get this one a lot. And I think that there's some historical reasons for that uh, that we can go into when we get to that part of the webinar. So with that, um, how do I optimize my table schema? So you really need to think about how you're going to be accessing that data once it's once it's stored in your in your cluster. And so uh, you take a look at this dashboard here. Uh, you're, you're, it's a monitoring dashboard here. You're storing data over time. You know each host has multiple devices, whether that's CPU, network, RAM, etc. And then each of those de devices on that host has multiple measurements. Um, so if you look at the, the right-hand side of the bottom there, a typical query for this graph would be, you know, selecting the host every five minutes is your time. You want the average CPU during those five minutes from that table. And then, you know, you have a front or a where with the date. And then we only want one measurement per graph, right? So, you know, and measurement equals CPU usage. Uh, and then we're going to group by timestamp and then the host. And so, you think about you know that typical query. How would I optimize my table in ClickHouse? And you know here's an order key unoptimized version. This is the the naive way of of setting up the table. So you have you know you have your create table statement. The host is the VM. The device is that the you know what what um, what part of the host you're measuring. Uh, the measurement is the actual type of measurement, and then the value of that measurement, and then along with the timestamp. And so a naive way would be just to, hey, we're going to order by this, by the timestamp. And so we're going to say, hey, I want, um, you know, I want to just treat it like a time series database and just drop everything in sequential order. As it comes in, I want to store it in that order. What that doesn't give you is data locality and or data sorting by other things that will affect, um, affect your um, query performance um, or, or disk utilization for that matter. And so... If we want to talk about you know better ways to optimize that, um, first we'll talk about the compression factor. So we already have a twelve compression factor just based on ordering it by time. Can we do better? Can we can we find ways to you know more compress the data and make it uh, less I/O throughput from your disks uh, when you're trying to trying to scan that data? And so the very first thing you can think about is changing your order by. Um, order by is very important when it comes to your ClickHouse tables. Think about, you know, what am I going to do that's going to sort that data on disk, have data locality so that I can compress like data. Um, so you, in this case, you know, we know we've got a host, we know I have a device and we know I have a measurement, and then we're gonna stick the timestamp last. And so now it's it, that's the sequential order of sorting. And so now we, you know, we're working on how do we better compress that data? And so now that we have a better order buy in place, are there other things we can do with some of that sorted data? And, you know, ClickHouse has some cool features um, like codex. And so on this slide here, uh, we're using a double delta codec for the date time. So that's a diff of a diff every date time in, in order. And so then it's only storing the diffs from the last date time. And then the same thing with um, 
with the value of the float because it's it, it's only going to differ so much from the last value so that it, you know it becomes uh, smaller in memory and, or smaller on disk uh, to store that. So we go from a twelve compression factor to a compression factor of 20, over twenty six. Um, neither timestamp uh, nor the value won't change much between the two rows. So that's why we can use a delta codec. And we're always going to have the same host with the same devices, and the same devices have the same measurements. So it just it, it's like a snowball effect to have that compression factor of, of 26 here. So then if you go back and you think about that first query that we did on the dashboard, and you know, I'm selecting the host, I'm selecting the, the time every five minute interval, I'm selecting the average value of the CPU, where my measurement is CPU usage. So if I look at my order by currently, you know, it, it, yes, it's compressed very well, but is it the most, uh, am, am I able to, you know, not scan so much data based on my order by uh, key? And, and I would say no, because we're all, we have that measurement in there. So why don't we, why don't we do something on the measurement? And in this case, we're going to move the measurement over to the very first part of your order by. Now, when you do that, now I can discard any data, you know, when I and just skip all the that data that's not measurement equals CPU usage. So automatically I'm going to get a speed improvement because now I'm not, I'm just discarding all the data. I'm, I can skip all that. I don't need to um, even worry about any of the host device timestamp, any other, anything else I'm pulling back in my, in my select query. Um, I don't need to worry about that because uh, the, the measurement is taken out of the, the picture there. So when you, when you want to compare those, um, and processing speed, uh, you go from that unoptimized, it's scanning 26 million rows, um, 1.6 or 0.16 seconds, um, but it's scanning all the data because it has to go through every, you know, our only um, order by was the timestamp. And so it has to go through every row and find anything that says CPU, CPU utilization for the measurement type. And then you go to highly compressed. So now um, we put measurement into the, um, end of the order by key, but it wasn't first. It was, so, you know, it was, it was I think it was third in the, in the list. And so when you do that, you know, we were able to, you know, sort, scan and discard, you know, almost 25 million rows, but we still had to go through more. Um, when you go to the optimized, now, you know, you look at the speed increase, it's a 5X speed increase. And what is that, a 25X um, number of rows reduced? Um, so really you're, you're working on, the compression factor, data locality and sorting, and not dealing with the bottleneck of IO throughput when you're only scanning uh, 819,000 rows versus 26 million rows. Okay, so I got a question here on for that slide, but it looks like yeah. we already answered on, uh, on that. So I just also uh, noticed that there is a huge difference in number of, of rows in the first try and in, in the third one. So can you can you explain how is it affected? So um, how how ClickHouse optimized that just um, using this optimization of order by? So what is the magic here? It, the the magic here is saying when you optimize with the measurement being first. I know that's part of my where clause. It can skip right to measurements that only have CPU usage. So you know think about skip indexes here, and I do not have to worry about um, any any. Uh, any rows that don't have CPU usage as um, as my first in my order by, and so when it's when it's on disk, I'm just dropping. I'm just skipping past all that data, and I'm I'm stuck with only the 819,000 rows that have that as a um, as a value in that in that column. Got it. So basically, you want to say that ClickHouse can start more efficiently use keep indexes in that case. So it could it yep. could keep much more data. That's awesome. Okay, got it. Yeah. And just in the, changing the order of the of the fields in the order by so. <laughs> exactly. So you really need to think about you know what you're in you know you know what your select clip, uh, statements are going to be, what your queries are going to be at the end of the day um, to know how to optimize. And there's no one size fits all for. You know, you know what the order by should be. The general rule of thumb is three to five fields in your order by. Lowest cardinality on the left, highest cardinality on the right. Usually, that's your timestamp uh, as your last in your order by. But you know, those first four, three to or two to four in your order by, it really depends on your your query usage patterns. Got it. 
Thanks. <laughs> yep. Next question we get asked often is, should I shard my ClickHouse cluster? And you know, when I, when I think about sharding my ClickHouse cluster, um, more often it's for, for write throughput because I'm saying, hey, I want to write data, but I can't, my one machine won't keep up with the writes for delivering all to one, uh, one machine. And so how do, how do I split that out? How, so then if you deliver some data to each node, and I'll show that here. Um, so when you think about sharding, it's, you know, usually for write IOPS or if the data won't fit on one machine. And so uh, in this case, on this slide, the write IOPS, I'm, I'm having a third of my data delivered to three shards. And then if I want to have replicas for read concurrency, fault tolerance, you know, you replicate that data. So the red is replicated to another machine. Typically, if you were to do this in production environment, you would also have the blue to another machine and the green to another machine. Uh, but just in this example, so it doesn't clutter, clutter the image. A third of my data is delivered to three different machines, and then at the end of the at the end of the query, when I when I select from those, if I try to do a full table, I have to um, have those query results merged back on wh whatever host you were on uh, accessing. So there is some you know logic behind the scenes that does complicate it and and could slow things down um, if you don't need to shard um, for that for that right IOPS reason. So more often than not, because of the, the higher latency, the, the added complexity, recommend not sharding, um, it, especially in a managed environment like what we have at Double Cloud. Um, we would recommend scaling up your, your machine, so adding more CPU and memory. And then if the data won't fit all on SSD, that's where we have the hybrid cloud or hybrid storage uh, offering. So repurposing the TTL statements uh, in ClickHouse at a table level. So if you, instead of dropping data after 30 days or 60 days or whatever, let, let's move it to another disk. Let's move it to S3. S3 is redundant by, by default. Um, and so you can still access that data um, on that S3. And from a, a query standpoint, um, there's no difference. No, no change in the queries need to be made. Um, usually it's using the you know partition by you know, partition by month, let's say, let's move it, move the data over to S3. And then if an end user queries data that's on there, um, behind the scenes, we'll cache some of that and we'll, we'll, we'll make it uh, accessible um, to, to the, to the uh, query statement. Um, I tell my customers, I, I like to see, you know, the base dashboards hitting SSD. And if somebody wants to move the slider back a year, you know, and then their dashboard to access more data, okay, then, then they can wait a few seconds for that data to be returned from, from S3. You got it. So, and again, <laughs> I have a stupid question. So Go I heard it. about the zero replication and, uh, <clears throat> and Yulia announced feature about uh, read replica, parallel read replicas. Uh, can you yep. elaborate a little bit more about that and how sharding and replicas uh, is fitting here? Yeah, so um, zero copy replication, you know, it's not really for the speed aspect. Uh, it's more how the data is stored and it's already stored in S3. Um, the, the multiple replicas with the, the parallel reading, um, if you have a replica, replications uh, or replicas of your cluster, it can access that S3 in parallel. And I think that's a new feature released last month. Um, so instead of instead of one replica trying to scan um, all the data in S3, you can have all your replicas um, trying to scan that different parts of the data in S3, and that way it can return the result step faster. And that used to be a feature only available in the sharding uh, side, where you you could do like basically distributed um, queries and then rejoin those your merge those result sets. Um, and in this case, that's now available on the replica side. So especially with an S3 backed um, hybrid storage. Um, makes for faster performance. So basically, so ClickHouse is moving to decoupling storage from from the compute, right? So um, that's, uh, that's remove is decoupling uh, compute. Uh, so one node to a particular partition of the data. So it's awesome. Yep. Thanks. Next question we get asked uh, quite a bit is, should I use materialized views or projections? So kind of helps understand what a materialized view and what a projection is. Um, to share this diagram, I know it's a little complicated, but stay with me here. Um, 
you know, in a, in a use case here, we have a Kafka table engine. So we have a Kafka uh, topic that we're streaming data in. Um, ClickHouse is a consumer of, of one of the topics. And so we use the Kafka table engine in ClickHouse. And then we build a materialized view on top of that to then deliver data to another merge tree based table. So more performance, you know, the, the, the workhorse of the ClickHouse uh, table engines. And um, if you're coming from another DBMS, uh, you, you can think of materialized views in ClickHouse as triggers. It, it's really what it is. Uh, anytime something happens on the initial table, the materialized view does something. Um, some cases like this one here, pulling from Kafka, it may just be a direct transfer of data. So you, you store it in a, you know, a ClickHouse native merge tree table. Um, and then other times you use a materialized view, it's to enrich data or change data or transform data in some way uh, for, for further processing or you know, end user queries. And so then you know you can do um, two different two different functions with the materialized view. Uh, you can also do you know materialized views uh, landing from an emergency table and then do something with that again and then landing into another another table. Uh, projections, on the other hand, uh, they're really more like pre aggregations. Um, sometimes changing the order by key, just ways to help speed up different queries that you're you're running on on the same table. Um, some caveats about um, materialized views and projections. Materialized views can be one to one to one, but it can also be many to one or one to many. So you can say, "Hey, I want to do some some pre-join logic, which I'll show later," or I want to, you know, do some roll-up tables. So I can do that with materialized views. Um, projections is really a one to one because it's still the data is still residing on that base table. Um, which, because it's residing on that base table, you need to think about. What if I'm, you know, want to delete data that's, you know, my my second data that's, you know, aged out? Um, if you did that and there was a projection on that table you know, to roll up, you 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 will lose some of that. Um, now, materialized view, it's creating a copy of the data. So storage storage requirements, you know, you need to think about, um, and you know, what what the end goal is of the of the second table or the projection. So you think about projections. The, another good point there is um, under the hood, um, it'll automatically, um, the, query, the query optimizer will determine whether it should use a projection or not. So let me go ahead and show a couple examples. Um, one of a materialized view, one of a projection. So materialized view, uh, you see here uh, in the yellow, I underscore MV, so I know that's a materialized view. And it sits on top of this device last state table that I've created. Um, and it's how it's populating that the triggers is when anything happens on the monitoring data opt table, um, it'll automatically uh, do that select statement and deliver that data to the device last state. On the other hand, the projection that's saying, "Hey, I want to roll up the data in the same table because I most of my most of my queries are on an hour basis, and I'm not going to truncate the data. I like I like storing that data in, in my emergency table, so." I'm going to create a, an hour um, projection. And then what I want to do is, you know, do an alter table statement. You can also do projections at the, when you create a table, but more often than not, I see them as alter table statements. And because of that, I want to materialize that projection. So then I'll run and immediately run an alter table uh, to realize, materialize the projection uh, so that it starts populating that, that projection. And, um, I got a, I got a question here. So, as I understand, you you will not see these kind of projections in a, in a table schema. So uh, it will be stored under a hood somewhere. Um, then how I will understand that ClickHouse is using these projections during my queries, so during yeah. the execution of the queries, and it's an efficient one. Yeah. So the the, the optimizer will determine whether it's um, whether it should use a projection or not. And the way to determine if it's doing that, you can do, run explain as part of your uh, your select statement. So you can you know prefix it with explain and it'll explain how the, the query um, was completed. Okay, got it. So it's kind of uh, during developments, I can debug that stuff. So using explain um, course, okay, got it. Exactly. Look here on the, you know, we're, we're still sorting by host. We're still grouping, or, you know, so our, our group buys are still are by host here um, on these materialized views. Uh, so you think about that. Um, yeah. And then we'll talk about this ClickHouse support joins. 
And so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of rumors out there. You, you find anywhere on the internet, you know, people are asking, does ClickHouse support joins? And, you know, I think that some of this is historical. Um, the first versions of ClickHouse did not support joins. And then newer versions added support for joins. Uh, supports, you know, I think pretty much all the ANSI SQL joins. Um, but, but that may not always be the fastest way to complete a task or to complete your query uh, in ClickHouse. Um, so we can talk about some ways to either avoid joins or, you know, optimize some of those joins. So ways to avoid joins, uh, denormalize your table. And so, you know, you think of the OLTP days and you want everything in third normal form and you want, you want to make sure that uh, you have no redundant data in your database um, versus an OLAP where it's like, hey, let's maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense to have that in a separate table or to, um, you know, have it in third normal form. So, you know, that, that's definitely uh, a reason or a way to avoid some of those joins. Um, another way you can avoid joins um, are to use dictionaries. And so basically those are reference lists. And then, you know, think of star schema, slowly changing tables. Um, and, um, you, you know, use some create dictionary uh, syntax. And then you can either, there's two different ways to access that data that's in the dictionary. Uh, you can use some specific dictionary syntax or uh, I think since version 20.4, you've been able to treat it like a join. And so uh, ClickHouse, the query optimizer will recognize that that table is actually a, a dictionary and it'll you know, speed up performance uh, significantly because you've, you've defined it as a dictionary. Are, are these dictionaries uh, stored in the RAM or in, on the disk series? Yep, so um, depends on how you, you set up your, your cluster. Um, lazy loading would mean that it's um, loaded only once it's been, um, you know, once a query has been ran against it, or you can um, not have lazy loading so that it loads it at, at cluster start time. Okay, got it. So it, it will store it in, in the RAM, so during the execution of a query, so, or Correct. at least on a second query. Okay. Correct. So... I want to talk more about nested fields. I, I think that um, that's something that um, can help in a lot of use cases. Um, you know, this ad tech use case kind of uh, talking about a little bit here, you know, how many clicks does it take to get a conversion uh, on campaign XYZ? And so you can see a couple different user journeys here on the slide. I have a click, some time goes by another click, and then um, and then they, they purchase. Uh, another one had, a, you know, four clicks throughout this time span here never purchased, and then you have another one that click, waited some time, purchased, click again, uh, waited some time, and, and, and purchased again. So the, a typical way to do that would be to, um, you know, set up uh, two tables. You have a clicks table, you have a conversions table, and you say, hey, I want to I join these on user ID. And so if you look at the user ID on, or the order by on both these, uh, User ID is first because that's part of our part of our join, and, and you know we're going to be selecting based on user ID. So it makes sense to order those tables by user ID. But when I do this, I'm I'm joining, uh, you know, I'm doing enter join, you know, clicks user ID versus con versus user ID, and then I'm you know counting those number of conversions and then summing up the total value of those conversions. Uh, it takes you know 0 0.84 seconds. Uh, in ClickHouse terms, that's that's too slow for us, right? So, what can we do to better improve uh, query performance? Um, and and the answer here is to use some nested fields. So, if I want to use nested fields here, you can see on the right, you can see the nested and then open prints. You know, the two fields, um, kind of like that Excel sheet that where you you've embedded um, multiple values into that single column or single row column, so, so that single cell. And so here I'm, I'm creating a new table, you know, using everything from the conversions, plus I'm nesting the, uh, the click timestamp and the, the campaign ID at, as that nested field, again, uh, ordering by user ID. So how would I, how would I fill this table? So um, I can, you know, run a select as, uh, or insert as select, if I already have data in those, base tables. Uh, if I don't have data in those base tables, I can immediately create this materialized view to fill it. And then you can see the, the group array of statements there um, that, that gives me the, the nested values uh, to, 
to insert into um, this new combined table that has the nested fields. So the data on the right table would be automatically updated uh, because it's a kind of using materialized CU mechanism to update. Yeah, got it. So you don't Correct. need to uh, to do something extra or doing some extra in shorts. It, it, it all depends on, you know, if you already have data in those first tables and now you want to replicate it over, um, materialized view will only do triggers on new data. And so, you know, you can go back and say, you know, the way that I would do it would be to um, create the materialized view, wait a little bit, see what data has populated, find the earliest timestamp, and then do a um, insert into a select where timestamp is less than. And that way you can grab all the historical data. Okay, guys, it's a little bit complicated for me in my t-shirt. So, but okay, I got it. So you will use a materialized view to uh, to offload all that to stuff. Offload to... it, make, <laughs> yeah. it, make it automatic. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, materialized views, because they're triggers, any new data will, will be moved over. It's only if you need the historical data. Uh, <laughs> if you didn't create the materialized view when you were setting up your, your data pipeline. Okay, that's cool. So in this slide, we talk about um, you know the nested fields, and you can see the you know eleven million rows scanned almost uh, almost a full second when I did the inner join on on the two. Um, when I've nested that data, I can do the array join on itself. Um, I'm only scanning one million rows, and I've you know increased a factor uh, of over eight uh, in speed. So between you know, thinking about your um, wh whether you're going to denormalize the data, which is when you're nesting it, you kind of are, right? You're kind of denormalizing data. So that's a specific use case of denormalizing. Or whether you're using dictionaries, think about ways to avoid uh, large table joins and putting all that in, in, in memory uh, for your ClickHouse cluster. So with that, I just want to show the double cloud architecture real quick. Uh, obviously, we're talking about our managed uh, ClickHouse as the main topic of today's conversation. Uh, I hinted at the, the Kafka uh, stream processing available. Um, you saw the dashboard at the beginning of our visualization tool. Uh, and then we also have a way to help get data in using our double cloud transfer. So we can help, um, you know, UI-driven way of getting data into managed ClickHouse, um, visualizing that uh, at the end of the process, uh, trying to be open source components from start to finish uh, and cloud agnostic. And with that, um, just want to really quickly summarize, and then I'll and then I'll ask or then I'll have people ask questions. Um, you know, today we talked about you know different ways that you can optimize your ClickHouse cluster, whether that's finding ways to tweak your order by that's going to mostly align with your application logic. Um, should I shard my cluster? Or should I just grow my clusters and then use things like hybrid storage? And you know, what are and how should I use materialized views or projections? And then, you know, the age old question, does ClickHouse support joins? Any questions from the audience? I think somebody from a uh, chart have a question and raise the hand. So Alexei, uh, I think we can um, um, add the opportunity to, uh, to ask your question uh, or you can, yeah, go on. Yeah, Alexei, you need to um, mute yourself and you can free to go to ask a question. Or you can drop it uh, in the QA chat if you would like. All right, I, I see one question. Oh, here it is. Um, you were describing the hybrid storage on S3 can help avoid sharding but we are using ClickHouse on-prem. If my data doesn't fit on one node, then it's not possible to avoid sharding in my case, right? And well, you know, that is definitely one reason to shard if it won't all fit on one, uh, but you can still implement solutions by using either S3 or S3 compatible tools. Uh, so, you, you know, MinIO would be something good, um, but you might, might be difficult setting that up, um, which is why, you know, we kind of make that as part of any time this cluster spun up in, in double cloud, um, it automatically has an S3 bucket behind it. All the all the logic for 
um, you, using those TTL statements to offload data is already built in on, you know, quick, you know, addition of a TTL altering your table uh, to add that S3 back storage um, for your, you know, for the on a per table basis. So the short answer to that is yes, if you can, if you can, you know, make it realize that there's S3 or S3 compatible storage behind the scenes, uh, you can avoid sharding in that case. Um, I have another question. Um, I have a big table with a different query pattern, so I cannot create an order by to fit it all in, into all my queries. What would you suggest in this case? I think that's a perfect use of a projection. Um, you know, I, I kind of hinted at that earlier. Um, if you want to change your order by, that's a good use of a projection. So you know the data, you still want to retain all the data. So you don't necessarily need to create a materialized view and duplicate that data. Um, but you want you have a different access pattern for some of your some of your queries. And you could that's when you can create the um the projection um on the same table. Um you just change the order by and then you can support multiple query patterns. Um, if, if you don't want to deal with the projection logic, um, something I can add there is, you know, try to find the order by that fits the majority of your queries and then start prioritizing your compression because your, your, your bottleneck is always almost always going to be um, IO throughput um, of the disk. And so if you can, you know, retrieve less data from disk, um, it, it's just going to, it's going to, you know, further optimize your queries and increase your, your query speed. Do I have any other questions? So I'd like to say I had his hand raised. It's not raised now, but um, if you do have something, uh, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. Um, we're always willing to assist. I even just jump on a call and, and talk about you know some of the same topics. Uh, no, no questions too silly, right, Vic? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm fine. <laughs> or you, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, left QR code is book a meeting or a demo, and then uh, the right QR code. Uh, if you want to spin up a cluster on Double Cloud, uh, click that special offer, additional starting credits, no credit card required. Yeah, it looks like we will need to, to run another kind of type of, uh, in, in our, uh, another part of the, that webinar because we have other most common questions that we didn't answer today. That's true. Uh, about deduplication and how is the collapsing merging trees working and but i think it's a uh, yeah we, we should run another one all right that sounds good let's let's plan that victor <laughs> all right thanks everybody for your attendance um feel free to reach out thank you